Excellency, the Chairman of the National Reform Council, Professor Dr. Thien Chai, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think the, our keynote speaker doesn't really need any introduction. He's uh, a real man of all season, very successful academician, very successful politician, as well as a very successful internationalist. Among many positions he has uh, uh, occupied, including uh, professor at Thomasat University, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Secretary General of ASEAN. Presently, he is the chairman of the Future Innovative Thailand Institute. He may stay with outside of the mainstream for the time being, but we never know when he will come back. So it is my great pleasure on behalf of the organizing committee of the 16 KPI Congress to invite Dr. Sulin Pitsuwan to give us a keynote address, please. Thank you very, very much, Kun Ching Chai. I thought when you began with, he probably needs no introduction, the introduction was going to be long. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very strange gathering indeed. Most of us are from Thailand. A few guests from abroad, but I have been asked to deliver my speech in English. I think it shows that Thailand is very transparent. And that is, we want to do our psychoanalysis in the open air so that all of us can at least draw some conclusion and reach some consensus to the extent that we can about the political malaise that has troubled us for the last eight decades. It was my idea proposing to Dr. Bawonsak, the Secretary General of the King Prachatipuk Institute, KPI, that this year we should be talking about eight decades of Thai democracy, why it has failed, and how to make it work. But the idea was proposed before the coup d'etat. <laughs> Little that I knew that I would have to be delivering the keynote speech on that very subject. Early in the year, I understand that we were extremely anxious, extremely insecure, extremely uncertain about our political future. So I thought we should think, we should analyze, and we should somehow look into our path of democracy or our efforts on the path of democracy in the past eight decades. And it was my idea to bring the issue 
to Ambassador Mark Kent from the British Embassy, at the British Embassy, over lunch, thinking that the experiences of the world, the UK, our European colleagues, our American colleagues, our Japanese colleagues, how they have gone through their own struggle for democracy. So that the Thai people could understand our own experience in the context of the historical, of the global struggle for democracy. So, what is it that has been the theme of Thai struggle for democracy? Since 1982, we have had 19 constitutions. Each lasted about four years. So much so that a researcher at Oxford went to the British Museum, the library, and asked if he could borrow a copy of the Thai Constitution. The librarian said, sorry, we do not keep periodicals here. Because we have come up with so many of them, hoping that this one is going to be, the last one is going to be the perfect one into the future. Well, we are at it again. And the chairman of the Reform Council is here with us. And I understand you have already appointed or elected or selected the drafting constitution, council or committee. Congratulations. I hope this time it's going to last longer than four years. But since 19, 1932, when the major political reform took place here in Bangkok, the inspiration was from Europe. The inspiration was from the struggle for freedom, for liberty, for political rights enshrined in the documents, in the history of our friends in Europe, the Magna Carta. You know, the other name of the Magna Carta, 1215, was the big charter of liberties. The French Revolution, 1889, was also liberty, equality, and fraternity. Liberty is there. Freedom is there. Equality is there. And in between, of course, the American Revolution of 1776, when the famous phrase, all men are created equal, endowed with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That phrase was very, very powerful. That phrase was the inspiration of many, many countries fighting and struggling for independence and for freedom themselves. Well, the Kanak Rat, the People's Committee in Thailand, returning from Europe, absorbed the inspiration and the ideas of democracy, came back and thought the Thai people were ready for the same civilized way of governance. Therefore, the reform of 1932. Well, we have been 
working on that path, we have been walking on that direction and journey for the last eight decades. Things have changed tremendously since 1932. A lot of our people have been better educated. Wealth has been created. Tremendous wealth has been created. And a lot of people around the country have grown up hoping and looking for opportunities to participate more meaningfully in the governance of our country. Well, they have been disappointed many, many times along the way. First and foremost, by the time 1932 came, we, the Thai polity, has inherited the system of governance that was very, very centralized here in Bangkok. Centralization came earlier in this century, in last century, at the end of 19th century, because the Thai monarchs, Thai sovereigns, the centers of power of the Thai state had to struggle, had to fight against colonial powers. With the countries dispersed, with many, many governing families, Chiang Mai, Uttaradit, Nakhon Sawan, Pisanulo, Nakhon Si Tamarat, Songkla, the country was not in a good shape to resist colonialism. So Rama the fourth, Rama the fifth centralized the country. And that centralization had remained up until today. When socioeconomic changes have taken place, when income has, raised, has risen, when production and transformation and industrialization have taken place here in Thailand, particularly since 1960s, end of 1960s onward. So income has risen. The economy has diversified. Thailand is the second largest economy in ASEAN, but most diversified. Every profession you can find here. Because of that diversity, because of that prosperity, the people and the country needs more space to breathe and to live and to work and to manage their own affairs. Came the year 2,500 right after the Asian financial crisis, 2,500, the frustration was all around the country. People want more from the states. People want larger space for themselves. People want to participate in the affairs of the state, but they have not had a chance to because the bureaucracy was centralized. Governors were appointed from here. Police inspectors were appointed from here. District officers were appointed from here. Judges were appointed from here. Attorneys were appointed from here. All functionaries of the state were appointed from the central center of power, including the military personnel all around the country. You know what happened then? At the end of the financial crisis, about 2000, about uh, 
2544 or 2001, 2002, about that time. The frustration around the country was articulated, was expressed in the form of a political storm riding on the coattail of the promise that we are going to deliver justice, we are going to deliver better equality of education, of health care to the people. But what happened after the, that storm of expectation of the people in the countryside, in the periphery? What happened? Once the group that promised a new vision for Thailand, a new decentralized Thailand, a new equitable Thailand got into power in Bangkok, you know what happened? It turned around and co-opted that centralized bureaucracy itself. So the bureaucracy, Rabo Brachakan, had become an instrument of control further. The bureaucracy, Rabo Brachakan, had become the in instrument of oppression even further. Man klai pen ong kon le nui ngan thi chai rabob upatham khao pai kuop kum khao pai jat kan khao pai tang tang khao pai leun khao pai plot khao pai yai khao pai hai tam neng thi sung khun. This became a family affair. So, meanwhile, the whole country was going through this economic transformation. Growth, growth, growth. And you know what happened? We have been on this road of national development for the last five decades. But the gap between the rich and the poor in this country is going even bigger, bigger and bigger. คนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวยคนรวย
the problems, the malaise, the diseases, the political troubles that the country have been going through in the last several months. The theme of this conference is Eight Decades of Thai Democracy, Dynamics of Balancing Power. It is not balancing power in the international relations. It's balancing power here inside the Thai polity. It's balancing a power here among different groups, different sectors of the Thai polity of the Thai state, how to balance here. And I have described what Thailand has been going through to friends outside of Thailand, including Japan, including the US, including in the UK, including in Europe. Thailand is looking for and trying to find its own new political balance. The problem is we have been trying to do this for many times in the past. <laughs> and we are at it again, trying to find that new balance that would give us a firmer ground to stand on, to work on our problems into the future. So the first item that would be worked on, would be discussed, is balance in the power structure of the state. Institutions, the executive, the legislative, the judiciary, and various other institutions, various other check and balance mechanisms, we need to establish those things and that will be addressed in the first item. Second is balance in the legislature. <laughs> How do you try to find the balance there? The relationship between the majority and the minority. The relationship between coalitions, members of the coalition, the government. One thing that is seriously wrong about us in the parliament over two decades that I was there, observing from outside in the last seven years, it is this. We think electoral victory is a license. We think electoral victory is a We think power is unlimited once you have the victory in the electoral competition. We think when we have the majority behind us, we can do anything and everything. There's no limit to it, which is not true. In a viable and workable democracy, you have the constitution to respect as a frame to limit you. You have the laws that you have to abide by. You have various other norms, political norms, that you have to live with, and you have National values, yes, national values and traditions, not written anywhere, but you are not going to go against those norms and those values. The British Constitution doesn't exist. There is nowhere in the British written law that the parliament shall not last more than five years. There is nowhere in the British Constitution that the prime minister will have to come from the parliament. There's no way in the British Constitution that the, the Prime Minister will have to be the head of the largest party coming in the Parliament and and after the election. No way. But the norms, the traditions, have given the limits to the power that came from the people because the sovereignty lies in the people. So when you take power from the election as unlimited, as license to do anything, there will be opposition, there will be people who are suspicious, there will be people who are not quite comfortable with that kind of creeping power into everything. And that's what Lewitsky called competitive authoritarianism. So in the legislature, we have to think about how to make sure that the power of the people are not going to be, is not going to be hijacked for the purpose 
of certain groups, certain parties, and certain coalition. The balance in the parliament is necessary. Balance of power in the parliament is necessary. Check and balance inside. The third one is the balance in the relations between the political leadership and the bureaucracy. I have just mentioned that. How to create and guarantee that the bureaucracy will be protected from political interference? I had an opportunity to meet with Mr. Blair when he came in to share his experiences how to reconcile with the Northern Island uh, separatists. And I, I told him that the bureaucracy is a problem. I said, in your system, Your Excellency, Mr. Prime Minister, you have this TV series called Yes Minister. Meaning, when the political leadership wants anything, the bureaucrat will have to say yes. But I asked Prime Minister Blair, has there been an occasion when the bureaucrat said, no, minister. Even no, prime minister. Mr. Blair said, oh yes, when they don't want to go to jail with us, they will say no. Oh yes, when they can't take our policy, they will resign. The problem with our bureaucracy is, it is a collection of nepotism, relatives, friends of friends, Appointed because there's a phone call coming to ask for that appointment. Appointed because there's a name card saying that this person should be given that position. To the point where the entire bureaucracy has become totally weakened. Unable to perform the function. So the balance between the political leadership and the bureaucracy has to be found. Can we find a system that the bureaucracy has its own buffer? That any bureaucracy will have to have its own line of succession very clear. That you groom people coming up to become the atibadi or the palat. So that So that political leadership is not going to bring anybody from outside my protégé from somewhere and become a Tibidi and become Palat in your ministry. The bureaucracy will have to be shielded, will have to be protected, will have to be given a space of themselves, of their own, so that they will be saved from interference from the political leadership. Particularly when the, that political leadership takes Majority as license, as I said earlier. Corruption. Corruption distort power relations in the state. When you accumulate wealth, and in our system, when you have wealth, you have power. In our system, when you are rich, you are respected. We never ask, how did you get your Riches. We don't ask where ni the daima. We don't ask where did you get your ring from. It's a poetic, it's a poem that all ties know. Where do you get this ring of yours? How do you get this riches? When you have power, you have network. You patronize people, you fix people's problems with the police, with the attorneys, with the courts, with every power in the land you can fix because you have the wealth. Corruption distorts power relations in the state. And corruption is going to be the cause of so many problems that we will face in the future if we are not able to put it under control. So where to find that balance between wealth, power, responsibility, and the right to put that name down? Without that name, you don't get the license. But with that name, give me 30%. 
that kind of corruption will lead to more power corruption, will lead to absolute power. And you know what absolute power does? Absolute power absol corrupts absolutely. Concentrate power suffocates people. And with the kind of bureaucracy that we have, we suffocate people around the country. Because of that kind of abuse of power through bureaucracy, through corruption, through taking advantage of that power. And then the fifth item that you will be talking about would be the relationship between formal political institutions, the parliament, the political parties, the ombudsman, and various bureaucracies under the political leadership, the formal structure of power, and the people, people's politics, การเมืองภาคประชาชนถ้าเข้าร่วมการเมืองเฉพาะไม่ถึงสามนาทีในการเลือกตั้งไปรับบัตรเดินเข้าคูหากาใส่เดินออก less than less than one minute of participation in the political process of the country and no other interests in between no other opportunity to participate in between elections, that democracy is not going to last. That democracy is going to fail, that democracy is going to be taken advantage of, that system is going to be hijacked for self-interest, group interests, party interests. So the people, the civil society, the source of power, source of sovereignty, will have to be given the space so that they can play their role in all areas of public affairs, not only on the elections day, because that is very dangerous. When you, are, when you participate only three minutes in Kuha Lyuk Tang, that three minutes will be very precious for others because they can buy it, <laughs> because they can give you money, and you don't care because you are only interested in the three minutes that you were there in the, in the election booth. We must find a new balance for participation, for space, for interaction between the people and the formal institutions of our politics, our democracy, hopefully our new democracy. The last item is, I think, the heart of the problem. And I've been talking about this for many, many years. And that is the issue of sharing the power between the center and the localities and the people. Indonesia, under President Habibi, issued a law in the year 1999, devolved the power from Jakarta down to the countries, to the islands, to the 17,000 islands of Indonesia. And scholars have told us that because of that law under President Habibi, who took over from President Suharto, who was forced out of office because of the financial crisis in 1998, 1997, we were told that that law saved Indonesia as a country. That law prevented Indonesia from becoming a Yugoslavia of Asia. That law prevented Indonesia from being a Balkan of Southeast Asia, devolved the power from the center out to the people, out to the country, out to the periphery, 
so that we can save the country. Philippines has done the same thing even during the time of President Marcos. He was forced in his interim constitution to, play, to pay lip service to decentralization. To give room, to give space for the provinces to join the central government in the development of the country, he said. And Malaysia has a very, very complex system of federalism because they have their sultans, because they have their states, because they have their state law, because they have their many, many layers of federalism in Malaysia. But it's decentralized. My point is, we will have to think about this issue, and I'm glad it is your, one of your issues, Jan Ching Chai, that this is a very, very crucial and critical issue for Thailand today, decentralization. You know, when governors are appointed from Bangkok, when police chief appointed from Bangkok, district officers appointed from Bangkok, judges appointed from Bangkok, every position in the province appointed from Bangkok, military commanders appointed from Bangkok, you know what happened? Those appointed officials will walk to the people, to the countryside, to the regions, with their back to the people and facing Bangkok. Why? Because Bangkok appointed them. They will get promotion not from the people, but from the boss in Bangkok. And when you relocate officials from one province to the next, people have no way of knowing what's the record. What has he done? Has he been good all his career? Or he has been done, or he has committed certain mistakes, corruption, but he's being relocated to us as a punishment. People had no way to know. It has to be made transparent. And better yet, let them have their own officials through their own local provincial elections. We will have to think about that. Time has passed since Thailand could be governed by this suffocating centralized bureaucracy. We don't address this problem, we are not going to get through this critical period of competition, competition, and competition coming our way in every direction. Thailand will have to measure up to the demand and the pressure of competition. ที่จะเกิดขึ้นหลังจากกลายเป็นประชาคมหลังจากต้องเปิดประเทศรับกระแสโลกาภิวัตน์เพราะยืนอยู่ปกป้องตนเองขุดคูล้อมรอบตัว
I hope that is going to find its way into the new constitution. But you hear less about decentralization now. ไม่ค่อยได้ยินอะไรมากนักนะอาจจะเป็นเพราะว่ามันไม่ใช่ mindset ของคนที่มีอำนาจอยู่ในขณะนี้จะคิดถึง decentralization. อันที่สองที่จะต้องทำให้ได้แกปที่ห่างกันเจ็ดเท่าระหว่างคนกรุงเทพกับคนต่างจังหวัดต้องนำมาปิดให้ได้ The gap of income between Bangkok and the periphery seven times difference has to be bridged somehow. We are worst in Asia. In this income gap, the more we develop, the bigger the gap, and you can feel the sentiment of the people all around the country. And I am a provincial boy. I have that feeling that why we have less opportunity, we have less income, we have less. Of the infrastructure, we have less of the public services. Only because we live far away, this pressure is going to continue to grow, and we better be prepared for it. The other one is professionalize the bureaucracy. Let them do what they do best, what they have learned. What they have prepared themselves to do. Many appointments are not on merit system. A lot of appointments are not on the quality of people. But it's what Kunanan always said. It's in this country. It's not what you know. It's whom you know. And if that is the case, you are not going to have a professional. Functioning, effective, competitive bureaucracy. Imagine, imagine you are appointed an ambassador to a capital somewhere in Europe. See, s i p full of opportunities, full of potentials, full of technology, full of banks, full of financial centers, full of corporations wanting to. Come and invest in Thailand, but your ambassador is not capable of making those connections and negotiating and convincing and persuading people to come and invest in your country. What do you lose? You lose twice. One, you pay him or her, and you don't get the service back. Second, worse. You send wrong signal back to the office at home, because any of your colleagues who have quality, who have knowledge, who have technical expertise, are not going to function. Are not going to try to do anything because it will be concluded that you don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to share. I don't have to contribute because. In the end, promotion does not depend on what I know, what I do, what I serve. It depends on whom I know. เพราะฉะนั้นทั้ง bureaucracy กลายเป็น dead wood. It renders the entire bureaucracy dead wood. The bureaucracy has to be professionalized. The bureaucracy has to be neutralized. The bureaucracy has to be shielded from politics. And then, of course, the next one is the rule of law. l a k n i t i t a m apply it equally, rich or poor, big or small. You break the law, you break the law. Not that you break the law, but you know some people who are in power position, you get away with the law. ในฐานะที่เป็นสสเนี่ยได้รับโทรศัพท์ได้รับเสียงเรียกร้องได้รับการเยี่ยมเยือนทำไมอ่ะรถบริษัทนั้นมาชนลูกตายสัญญาจะจ่ายแปดแสน
จนเดี๋ยวนี้ยังไม่จ่ายท่านสอสอรู้จักใครบ้างไหมในบริษัทนั้นช่วยหน่อย There's no justice A relative whose son got hit by a car, dead, was promised by that corporation who hired those cars that they will pay 800,000 baht. In the end, there was no pay. In the end, the relative will have to come, ask me if I know anybody in the company so that I could appeal on his behalf, on her behalf. It's not the rule of law. It's the rule of men, of women. It's whom you know, not the equality under law that we need to establish in this society. And if all of you are proud of the fact that you know someone, you want to be trained in these courses at KPI, you want to go there because you want to make connections. Once you make connections, you know people, you get everything easily, right or wrong, legal or illegal. That is not going to save this country. On the new road of democracy, law is law. Applicable and applied equally, it doesn't mean anything if you have a big last name. It doesn't mean anything if you know anybody. It doesn't mean anything if you are in any position of power. If you are rich, the law will have to be the law. The police will have to take care of you, not the money will replace the culprits. That is not going to be a new democracy that we want. The last one is, of course, the system of education. It is extremely critical, in critical state, because we don't produce what the market wants. We produce what the society values, and that is everyone has to have Parinyatri. Everyone has to have Parinyato. But the tree and the toe and the egg, ti dai near. Again, it's not on the basis of your effort. And your schools and your professors probably are not quite serious about you doing the learning. So, you know, the World Economic Forum has a judgment on Thai higher education. It is abnormally low. When the educational system does not teach people to think, to, crit to think critically, to analyze and to reason for yourself and to make judgment for yourself, to solve problems for yourself, it is very, very easy for us to fail victims to what? To power, victims to wealth, victims to influence. And that is our problem. Because we are not critically thinking as democratic citizens should be thinking as responsible citizens should be thinking, as people in the open society should be doing, and that is, I decide on my own, based on my own judgment, with the information that I have, I'm not going to sacrifice my rights, my liberty, my vote, for any other reason except for the fact that I think this is the best individual, the best party, the best policy for Thailand. And I will remain active in the system. I will stand alert. Thomas Jefferson said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Sing thi than tong jai pue thi cha rak sa. เสรีภาพของท่านเอาไว้ให้ได้นี่คือการตื่นอยู่ตลอดเวลาที่จะเผชิญที่จะต่อสู้ที่จะลุกขึ้นมาท่วงจริง 
ทักถามและทวงถาม The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. We have to be vigilant from now on. เราต้องตื่นตั้งแต่บัดนี้เป็นต้นไปเราต้องเข้าใจว่าชาติอยู่ในภาวะขับขันเราต้องตระหนักว่า each and individual of us can make a contribution and can make a difference. And I'm glad that this Congress has invited a lot of our colleagues from the provinces, from the periphery, from the regions. Because there are more of us living out there than here. Because there are more of us who are going to have the influence on the direction of this country than us here in the capital. And I'm glad, and it was my advice from the beginning, that we certainly have a lot of goodwill, a lot of compassion from among friends from abroad, who wish, who want Thailand to succeed. Who wish, who want Thailand to find our own new balance? They have gone through the same struggles. They have gone through the same problems. They have gone through the same challenges. So I'm glad that our foreign friends are here, both academics and diplomatic corps, because I know for sure. That they have very good intention. I know for sure they wish us well. I know for sure they have experiences that they can share with us. I know for sure that they have a lot of goodwill experiences. Where they have gone wrong, we don't have to repeat. Where they have succeeded, we can look at their best practices. So thank you very much for being here, and I hope you will see for yourself that this country is free and open. We are doing our psychoanalysis in the open. We want you to see what we are going through, and if there is any way, any room that you can help, you can make a contribution. It will be welcome. Thank you very much, and good luck. Thank you, Kap Budekap. ขอบพระคุณขอบพระคุณดรสุรินทร์พิสุวรรณนะคะประธานสถาบันออกแบบอนาคตประเทศไทยและอดีตเลขาธิการอาเซียนที่ได้มาแสดงปาฐกถานําในเวทีประชุมวิชาการสถาบันพระปกเกล้าในครั้งนี้ขอเสียงปรบมือเพื่อเป็นการให้เกียรติท่านอีกครั้งหนึ่งค่ะ